Let's talk the new Yamaha R3 versus Kawasaki's Ninja 400. This is MotoGeno Chris here, and I just wanted to have a talk about these new beginner motorcycles, which fit into the 35 kilowatt power restrictions, which is pretty universal across many parts of the world. We use the LAM system here in Australia, and over in Europe, I believe it's the A2 system, which have very, very similar power restrictions. Now for beginner riders, after a racer, replica, sports bike or fared machine, there's really just the two main options that are available that are as close to a real sports bike as you'll get. Now there are a couple of additional options, but in my mind, the two big standouts are the Ninja 400 and of course Yamaha's R3. Kind of the outliers are KTM's RC390 and to a lesser extent, Honda's CBR500R. They're both in the picture, but they're different in a couple of ways. Now, Kawasaki's Ninja 400 has been available since 2018. And for 2019, Yamaha have updated their R3 with new styling, updated suspension, updated ergonomics, and a new dash. So, which of these motorcycles is best? The simple answer is there's no best choice. Sorry to disappoint. They each have some standout features, so there's some pretty significant differences overall, but you can't actually go wrong with either of these beginner motorcycles. Looking at the Ninja 400, there's a bucket load of extra torque, about 30% more than the R3 in fact, and it also arrives a little bit earlier. The big standout here is the great low to mid range, which is really punchy, and that makes for fun without having to rev the bike as hard. The top end is a fair bit more restrained in comparison, and it's still great, but it just has a, a flatter delivery once the revs get right up there. The Ninja 400 brakes also, in my opinion, are a bit more powerful. While there's also a slipper clutch fitted to this particular bike, and it's got arguably the lightest clutch action I've actually ever seen on a motorcycle. Now, if you're doing a lot of commuting, the light clutch action really does come into it because when you're in start and stop traffic all the time and you're constantly going into neutral and first gear and second gear and you're feathering the clutch a lot, that hand strain really does add up. The slipper clutch also assists in making sure that if you're aggressively downshifting through the gears, you're not gonna lock up that rear wheel, but it's a little bit of a secondary consideration. The Ninja 400 also has a more raw feel to it as far as power delivery, which is partially thanks to that extra torque and that also translates into a less smooth engine overall, which includes the throttle response as well at times, particularly on a closing throttle, even with that slipper clutch as you transition to onto engine braking. Now with the 2019 R3, you're getting a smaller capacity parallel twin engine at 321 cc's. However, the big point of note here is that you're losing a bit of torque, but benefiting from a super smooth and very torque power delivery. In fact, if anything, the R3 feels just like an inline four cylinder. I mean, obviously there are some differences, but that's the, you know, that's the most common super sport machine. That's what we see most of the 600 and 1000 cc machines as, and that's what's being raced, generally speaking, in those categories. With super linear power and torque delivery, it's just got a kick-ass top end as well. So. Even though it does look on paper like there's quite a deficit as far as torque, in person I didn't find that at all. The R3 is super refined in this area and even with no slipper clutch fitted, downshifting through the gearbox is smooth as is transitioning onto and off the throttle. The engine also revs up quickly and easily and you'll be using far more of the rev range as a result before upshifting through the gearbox. Where the front brake feels a little more gentle than the Ninja 400, the suspension on the R3 is noticeably firmer, with the new KYB fork and stiffer shock setup, which lends the bike a bit of a sportier feel at the cost of a little bit of harshness on the really bad roads, particularly on the rear end of the bike. Now the R3 dash is an all digital and very easy to read item, and changes to the tank and ergonomics make it easier, for me at least, to lock in between the foot pegs and the tank with my knees. The overall ergonomic is compact, but at 180 centimeters, I had plenty of room with easy highway speed cruising and good wind protection. The R3 very much gives the impression of a proper full-size bike, but is also light and manageable. Now the Ninja 400 also runs an LCD dash. However, it's got an analog tachometer on there instead, and 
it feels particularly narrow between the legs, as well as being a very light motorcycle. Obviously, I'm an experienced rider, so for a new rider, whatever you jump onto the first time is, is going to feel a little bit intimidating. The seat height on the Ninja is 5mm higher than on the R3, so that's one thing to keep in mind. But I did not find that much of a difference between the two, realistically speaking. The one thing about the seat that I did notice is on the Ninja 400, it's a much harder seat than on the R3, and that is a comfort consideration. Now the suspension on the Ninja 400 is also a really well balanced system for me at 70 kilos. I've done a heap of kilometers on this bike. I think I've done 5,000 kilometers so far. Uh, now it's not quite as sporty as the Yamaha R3. The thing to keep in mind here is that both of these bikes have really good suspension systems. However, they aren't adjustable. You've got preload on the rear and that's it. So what you get on the bike is what you get, unless you want to spend some money, which to me on a learner bike, unless you're taking it to the track, is probably not the best investment. Both bikes offer all aspects of a good learner machine with an upright seating position that can easily be turned into a nice racer crouch, good vision through the mirrors and not too much vibration through the mirrors, plenty of steering lock, light feeling machines, low seat heights and an easy reach to the ground. Now one big area worthy of mention is of course styling which is a big aspect for nearly all riders. The Ninja 400 comes in a KRT special edition which looks just like the World Superbike race machines in lime green or there's a candy persimmon red option as well. Uh, the R3 features a gloss Yamaha blue option that's a bit more downstated than the Kawasaki options but looks very Yamaha while there's also a matte power black and matte candy satin red option. I should also mention there is a standard Ninja 400 in a nice gloss black as well for those who want the stealthy look. Both of these models feature modern lighting solutions. So for commuters who are riding at night, which I know I'll be doing a lot of now that daylight savings has ended, that's a really important aspect of it and I can say that they do a really good job. Now just to finish off, for those who like specs, the R3 is claimed 167 kilos while the Ninja 400 is 168, so they're really neck and neck in that aspect. The Ninja does feature a larger 3 10 10mm front rotor to the R3's 298mm item, and the Ninja 400 claims 33.4 kilowatts, where Yamaha claim 31 kilowatts. A somewhat interesting fact that you will find online is the Ninja 400 has been dynoed at around the 42 to 44 horsepower mark at the rear wheel by a variety of publications and owners. Now those are in markets without learner restrictions. So there's also a higher power version of the Ninja 400 available in some markets. I think it is claimed to be about the 49 horsepower mark. Meanwhile, the Yamaha R3 has been dynoed around the 35 to 36 horsepower mark. So there's a little bit of a difference there, as you'd imagine. The only figure I could find on the Ninja 400 in a restricted market was just shy of 41 horsepower on the dyno. And I think I'm gonna have to go get mine dynoed to figure out just what it's putting out as a point of comparison. Obviously, when these bikes are put on dynos, depending on how they're run and a whole heap of other factors, it can really vary. However, it's a pretty consistent figure in those unrestricted markets that those Ninja 400s are getting around that 44 horsepower mark. What does that mean for the everyday road user? Not really that much if you ask me. The engine characteristics are quite distinct as I mentioned earlier and they both offer great road going performance in their own way. They are really, really distinct. Both have posted speeds or indicated speeds I should say, of about 180 kilometers per hour on the dash. And then there's speedo error to consider there too. So they're no slouches for beginner bikes. You really can't go wrong with either of these machines. And I'd really suggest that you don't put too much stock in the figures on paper. Obviously it's gonna be great to be able to boast to your mate that you've got a 44 horsepower Ninja 400. However, Everyone knows there's a heap more to it than that. And it's really worth going and checking both of these bikes. Go for a test ride and just see how they differ because there's a pretty distinct difference between how these two motorcycles ride. 
and it's well worth having a proper look at both of them. The Yamaha 3 is so refined and so smooth, just like the R6. The Kawasaki Ninja 400, it's got a much rawer character to it, and it definitely has traded off some of that smoothness and some of that real reviness and that feel like an inline four for that great low to mid-range torque, which makes it an awesome thing to ride as well. But I can't pick a better bike out of the two of these, and that's keeping in mind that I own a Ninja 400. So I'm probably a little bit biased there as well. Anyway, let me know which of these two models you reckon is the better bike or which one at least that you'd pick because at the end of the day, that's all that matters. It's Moto Journo Chris here. Don't forget to sub, leave your comments and I'll be back soon. Stay safe out there.